Okay, so it's time to get started. Uh, Saram Tovi, Mayor of Tov, everybody. Uh, part three of A Woman in Kriyat HaTorah. We just discussed with Professor Lakshan, a blind person reading the Torah and other issues that came up in reading the Torah and, uh, you know, Mumim, et cetera. So we were discussing. So now we'll hear the, the topic on uh, on women in Kriyat HaTorah. That's, our, of course, our four-week, uh, you know, series. And today we'll get into the topic of um, Kvod HaTzibur, the dignity of the congregation. Bakasha Lori. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much. Noah Batzacha. Hold on, um, hold on. Before we start, before we start, very important. I want to thank uh, Laser and Shana Friedman for sponsoring the year today. Uh, to say thank you to Lori and to uh, say thank you for all the wonderful Shirim that helping get through the pandemic. So thank you to our good friends, you know, Yeshena and Laser Friedman. Bakasha. I want to thank the Friedmans also. You know, my first uh, contact with Torn Motion was at that medical ethics conference, and you know, seeing uh, seeing with laser in action was really was really something uh, with, with with all of you organizing that. It's a tremendous endeavor. Um, all right, I want to get started. We have so much to talk about tonight, but really, I, I, I am thankful for their sponsorship very much, and I'm thankful to all of you for joining us here tonight. Uh, so I do want to get started. So far, we've been talking about, to the extent we've been talking about women, every time I've been very careful to say that it's theoretical, that there's, that we, because, we, because we have this source that, that talks about women uh, laning, and then it sort of, it sort of uh, gives, and then it takes it away. And within that theoretical framework, what, we, what we've kind of covered so far is, the is that there is a there does seem to be at least a theoretical possibility that a woman could have uh, could could be reading from the Torah at least on Shabbat for at least some of the aliyot possibly not all of, not all of the aliyot and how much that would be limited is a matter of debate. We talked last time about what an aliyah is and uh, what it would mean for a woman to have an aliyah, which is also it's a little more complicated than just having a woman reading from the Torah. So that if a woman wished to have an aliyah, the best practice would be for the woman to both have the aliyah and read from the Torah. So we don't get into some some kind of more complicated questions about whether Shomea Ke'onea can apply in that scenario, um, et cetera. Or it's it's possible that it might also work in that kind of a case for a woman who's called to the Torah as an Ola to read along quietly with, with the Baal Kore. Um, not crystal clear exactly uh, how it how it comes together once we have the ole and the balkare separate um, for a woman to play uh, even in theory either of those roles. Um, we talked about in that case the woman being able to recite the brachot, where there are some opinions that she would never be able to recite the brachot, and that the the whole theoretical discussion was just for the era before the brachot were for each and every reading before and after. Uh, but we also saw opinions that, yeah, a woman could recite, in theory, those brachot, including uh, possibly even baruchu. So we've seen a wide range of opinion on that. And now I think it's time to finally look at this uh, at this source, which is the center of so much discussion. Our plan is like this. Tonight, we're going to be talking about what Kvod Sibor is and, uh, and what that should mean or why that should mean something for a woman reading from the Torah. And then next week, Be'ezrat Hashem, our plan is to talk about um, is to talk about the different the different ideas that have been advanced that would sort of uh, function uh, to enable a woman uh, to read from the Torah, notwithstanding kvod Sibor, and those have been very much debated as well, in particular in the context of uh, partnership midyanim. Some would say it's not even a matter of of debate in the sense that. Um, the great weight of halakhic authorities who ruled against it. And yet I think it's still very important for us to look at those arguments and understand them uh, from the inside so we can understand understand uh, where they're coming from. And, and if, there's, if, the, if the conversation is indeed really closed or what openings there might be. All right, so let's get started. I'm gonna move to the share screen here. Let's hope it goes well. And yes, beautiful, okay. Here it is, Vraita. Tanu Rabbanan, Hakol Olin Leminyan Shiva, Afilu Katan, the Afilu Isha. Everyone could count toward the seven readers of the Torah, even a minor, even a woman. We're focusing on the woman, of course. Avalamru Chachamim, but our sages said, Isha Lotikra Batorah, a woman should not read from the Torah or may not read from the Torah. 
mipnei kvod atzibor, because of kvod atzibor, which literally means the honor of the congregation, but of course our business tonight is to try to define that better. Um, but before we can get there, I want to already raise some of the questions that have been that have come up in recent uh, debates about partnership minyanim about reading this to uh, reading this uh, Braita and also reading the parallel to Sefta. So one of the one of the key points that uh, that have been that's been discussed is this phrase avala um, It's not the phrase. It's not a phrase usher. In other words, the 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 reading here. It's not. Uh, everyone can count toward the seven readers, even a minor, even a woman. Uh, but chachamim uh, gazru or asru, there's no language here of it being a decree or prohibited. The language is, but our sages said a woman shouldn't do it, may not do it. Uh, and the question is, what is the weight? What is like how? What is the halachic force of this phrase? But our sages said a woman shouldn't. And the, the truth of the matter is this phrase, what our sages said, can be used in different ways. So sometimes, um, it's probably more frequently, it's used in a purely halachic sense. For example, uh, the halacha of, um, of reciting vidui before we eat, sudam of second before Yom Kippur, is based on a structure like this. We say that the vidui, the mitzvah, starts um, at dark. On Yom Kippur, but our sages said a person should recite vidui confession before they eat and before they drink. And the Shulchan Aruch Paskin says, Okay, so this would be an example of a Braita, which tells us something, and then our sages say something a little different. And the, but our sages say, the little different thing they say winds up being clear-cut halacha. Um, another example has to do with to'ayim. Uh, the, here, in this case, we have a bride that says, lo yale alecha, shotness can't be upon you. Um, Aval ata mutar latzio takteha, but you're, takteha, you're allowed to put it beneath you. But our sages said it's forbidden to, to put yourself on top of shotness. Why? Because it could be that a thread would get on you and effectively somehow you'd be as, as though you were wearing it. And this is perhaps a stronger example of being similar to our Brita because this is an example where at first it looks like something's mutter. And then or saying something is not, you can't do it. Here though, they are using language usher. And this is paskind in the Shulchan Aruch, it's a straight halacha. So there's been some discussion about this avalam ruha chamin, actually a lot of discussion about it. Um, people who prominently brought it up um, include Rav, uh, Rav Daniel Schwerber. And one of the reasons that it was also, a, uh, or I think is, is more widely known as a, he's a professor in Barilan and he's a, uh, Atami Chacham, who's uh, supervised and edited and wrote a large part of a series called um, Min Hagdei Israel, in addition to a lot of other scholarly works, is also a, um, a Rav of Vashol in the old city in Yerushalayim. Um, so he brought the follow, he brings examples like this to call this into question. Um, this is from Masechet Chulin, and it's talking about someone, different people who were involved halachically with an object, uh, making some kind of ruling about it. Uh, maybe they said it was Tameh or Tahor or that it was Asur or that it was Mutar. And then technically, after that whole ruling is over, you've established that this chicken is kosher. The, 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 the people who were involved in that discussion, whether they were witnesses or they owned the chicken or they were the judge, all of those people could in theory be involved. I guess it's not the owner because we're talking about buying it. All of those people could be in theory involved after the ruling's been made in purchasing said object. Now, that's a little tricky because it's sort of like, you know, well, wait a minute. You just said that this is kosher and now you're buying it. Um, how it, it technically it's okay. The ruling is made and then the purchase is made. But as sages said, min hakiyor umin hadomelo. Distance yourself from that which is considered to be ugly and for that which resembles what is ugly. Um, so this is this is sounds more like a an ethical guideline. Now, again, the the, the these descriptions are a little tricky. What does it mean to say this is halacha and this is an ethical guideline? If our sages give us an ethical guideline, 
and it could translate into a concrete action, then that's also something that we're supposed to do. Um, it's this me'ikar hadin, you could ask, maybe the fundamental halacha here is that there's still room to be selling it. The, the situation here is a little bit more complex. It's a little bit less cut and dry halacha. So a lot of the discussion about this is centered around, you know, well, are we thinking of this as cut and dry halacha? Or are we thinking of this as something that's like a little bit more uh, in the oughts than in the musts? category of, uh, you could say, of, 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 of meaning, of legal meaning. Um, one thing that's interesting is that Rav Sperber himself originally came out pretty strongly saying, oh, it's not a halachic statement. Later on, he, he kind of took a little bit of a step back on that, and he said, well, it's not certain that it's a halachic statement. Um, so it, this, is, this is something that, um, that, that it's hard to make cut and dry, but the issue is that once it's already acknowledge that it's possibly a halachic statement or likely a halachic statement, then it's not something that's easily, uh, that, that can be just dismissed. In other words, if you could make an argument that, oh, every time a balamurcha hamim is used, it's not a cut and dry halachic statement, uh, that could be very meaningful here. Once we know that there's a good number of examples in which a balamurcha hamim is a very clear halachic statement, um, and those other examples where it's perhaps more of uh, what you're supposed to do is still not necessarily so distant from halacha. Um, it's a little harder to say that this is loose. And in fact, and we're going to see in, uh, shortly that over the generations in halachic discourse, it hasn't been treated as something wishy-washy. It has been treated as something that's a clear-cut halacha. Um, the second thing that comes up in trying to understand this bright stuff, is the Tosefta in Megillah, which parallels it. So the, the Brayta, remember, are, uh, te are texts from our sages of the Mishnaic era, which did not enter into the Mishnah. The Tosefta is sort of like a coherent work, an external work of such texts, the collection of them, which often in its organization and uh, a fair amount of time in its content parallels the Mishnah. The differences can be important. And sometimes, you know, you have a Brayta that comes in the Talmud, which is very close to a Tosefta, but not identical to it. And that's the case here. So here we have in the Tosefta, Hakol alin the minyan shiva filu isha filu katan. That looks very familiar. And now we have, Ein mevi'in et ha'isha likrot l'rabim. We don't bring a woman to read before the masses. Now, if the thing that were critical to us, and we already said that that doesn't, it doesn't seem to really work uh, to, 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 to simplify this at all. This Avalam Ruch HaChamim, but our sages says doesn't even show up here. A simple reading of this source is a woman in theory could count, but we don't do it. That would seem to be a simple reading of this source. Well, maybe it's a little bit less simple. And the reason why maybe it's a little bit less simple is context. The adjacent text in the Tosefta tells us, we actually saw this last week when we were talking about the origins of how we wound up with the Balkare. The adjacent text in the Tosefta tells us that in a show that, do, that only has one person who's a competent Torah reading, Torah reader, she'en la mishi ekra el achad, omed v'korev yoshev, v'omed v'korev yoshev, omed v'korev yoshev afilu shiva piyamin. That person gets up and sits down seven times. So now, we have an interesting question, which is, should this adjacency of this text to the concept that we're interested in affect how we read this tosefta? And if it does, how should it affect how we read this tosefta? Um, answer to neither question is clear cut. And in fact, if this affects how we read the tosefta, it could go in two completely different directions. One way you could read it might be, and this is this was suggested um, by by uh, by Professor Shaul Lieberman um, in his Tosefta Kipshuta. Uh, he suggested that maybe what's going on here is we're saying specifically we don't bring a woman out when we lack readers into our shul from some external place. But if a woman's already there, maybe she could read. He suggested maybe that's a reading. Um, then the truth of the matter is, um, and, and you know, uh, many proponents of partnership minyanim have quoted that um, from uh, from from Tosef uh, Kipshuta. The truth of the matter is, he continues and he says that there's another possible reading. Um, 
He, so first he gives that reading, and then he says, um, but for from another perspective, it's say that a woman could only count towards specifically the count the seven readers on Shabbos. Actually, there's a simpler explanation of the Tosefta. The way he thinks it's actually a simpler reading of the Tosefta is even if you only have one competent male reader, you should not have a woman read. So here's what I'm trying to say. As part of these debates about um, the meaning of the Brita in the Talmud, one of the things that's been raised is the parallel Tosefta. One claim that's been made is perhaps the parallel Tosefta's adjacency to the case of a show with only one competent reader might suggest that the problem is just with bringing a woman to read from the outside, but not having a reader, a woman reader from within the show. However, the fact of the matter is that that reading, the person who suggests that reading also says it's not the simplest reading. And the simplest reading is actually probably even more strict about women reading than how our how our Talmudic passage reads, right? Because the simple reading is even if we're taking context into account, which by the way, it's not clear that we should, even if we're taking the context and the Tosefta into account, the simpler reading is um, even in the case where you only have one reader, you wouldn't bring a woman in necessarily. So in practice, so it's hard to know. The Orza Ru and Tosfot read both bring the text together and seem to treat them as being related, but don't give any indication of what they mean by that. Um, Mori Varabi, my teacher, and Rabbi Rav Henkin Zetzal, um, who discussed these topics extensively. This is actually the last, um, the topic of Kriya Torah by women was the last topic we discussed last time we met before uh, he was nifter. Um, he, he did not think that you could learn anything decisive in any direction from the Tosefta. He did not think that Tosefta was really a player here in the halachic conversation. Um, he, he explained that he really thought the simpler reading could was, was more likely correct. And he's finished by saying, contiguity of paragraphs in the Tosefta is not proof that they're essentially interrelated. Um, so really, how has this Brita been, been read traditionally in halachic discourse, um, much more simply than, than we might think. Uh, I made it very complicated. If you look in the Rambam, when he paskins, he writes, Isha lo tibor mipnei Boom. He just says straight out, a woman doesn't read. He doesn't even quote the beginning of the Brita. Interestingly, and we're going to get back to this uh, eventually, the Shulchan Arach, when he paskins, more or less paraphrases the entire Brita, bringing the beginning and the end not just quoting the Rambam. We'll have to talk about why he does that. Um, but the Rambam very clearly poskins, there's no room for avala muhachamim or look at some parallel to to here, there's no ambiguity. He doesn't talk about a theoretical possibility at all. He just says, woman is not gonna be able to read the Torah because of Kvodot Tzibor. All right, this all brings us back to that question of what Kvodot Tzibor is. And we're gonna have to talk about what Kvodot Tzibor is in general, what it is with respect to Torah reading, and how that is relevant to women. So uh, this is a nice quote. You just had uh, Dr. Martin Lakshin here, so uh, you know, who, who actually advises some partnership with uh, His daughter, uh, Hannah Lakshin Bob, who's an, who's an old friend of mine, um, she, was, uh, she participated in a panel discussion. And she talked about how instinctively, she said two things. She said, first of all, but the sages said a woman should not read from the Torah because of the Torah Tzibor, the dignity of the community. The simplest explanation is that Chazal thought there was something undignified or embarrassing about a woman reading Torah for the congregation. Now, I have to say that's 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 shocked. Now, of course, the, the, it begs the question. What we're trying to understand is what is undignified or embarrassing about this? What is not kavodik about this? That's our question, right? But I think what she was really getting at, if you continue, is something else. Common sense would say in 2016, when women can be judges and teach Torah and run for president, this cannot be true anymore. Obviously, a plain common sense reading can't be the end of the discussion, but I think it should be the beginning of the discussion. And I'm putting it here because I think for a lot of people, uh, the common sense reading seems very natural. Uh, Rabbi uh, Mendel Shapiro uh, from Harnof, who uh, wrote an extensive article about uh, advocating 
uh, women's Torah readings in kind of a partnership, sort of a format uh, in advance of his daughter's bat mitzvah, um, uh, argues very strongly for this. He argues, well, Kvodot Tibur is, is about social status. Uh, that, and that seems to be what Hannah is getting at, right? It's, it's about social status. If a woman's a lower social status, that's why it's embarrassing. And if she's not lower social status, she, it's not. Um, the tricky thing here is that we don't have a lot of sources that explain this concept in depth, Not certainly not with regard to our specific case, but we do have some that touch on it and none of them seem to be talking about this. Um, that doesn't mean that it's impossible that social status played a role here, but it's it's difficult. It's difficult when we when we do have some sources that are discussing this concept and none of them are focusing on social status. It's difficult to say that that's really what this is all about. Um, and again, we have to figure out what it is all about. And unfortunately, still it is somewhat murky. So, what are some examples of quoted to board? There's not that many that come up in the Talmud. Fascinatingly, a lot of the examples, the, the, the examples of Kodotzi where they come up in the Talmud are overwhelmingly relate to some aspect of Torah reading or the ceremony with Kriya Satora. So for example, Ein Shalich Tzibor Rashai Lehavshit Et HaTeva Batzibor. The prayer leader is not allowed to uncover the container that the Torah is being kept in. Vim the tzibur, mipnek voda tzibur. Exactly what this means is also a little hard to tease out because we don't have this type of teva anymore. He's not talking about the Aron Kodesh. Apparently we're talking about there's some kind of extra wrapping that would take time for everybody to sit through undoing that if you were really about to use it, that would have been unwrapped already. The Torah would still be contained, but it wouldn't be as contained. It seems like this is an additional level of coverage around the Torah. And Rashi explains that's the problem. It's 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 kircha de tzibura. It's putting a burden on the congregation to make them sit when you're playing around with the Torah. And there's another example that's kind of like this. It says uh, Rav Huna, son of Rav Yoshua, says in the name of Rav Shesha. You don't roll. You shouldn't be rolling the sefer Torah to its proper place in the middle of Shul. Now this happened a lot during COVID, interestingly enough. The COVID wasn't a regular situation. It's what we call a shat hat situation, right? Generally speaking, it was a pressing situation when it had to be rolled. Um, but the problem with rolling was so strong that in some cases there were discussions about doing Torah reading out of order when there was more than one special reading. So there wouldn't be excessive rolling and making people sit and wait. For anyone who's ever been in a Shul that didn't have enough Sifrei Torah, and had to sit there while they're rolling or where the Gabai forgot to roll back the Torah during the week or something like that, um, it's schleppy. It is schleppy. And that's what Rashi says. She whom it's a pim the doma min lachach. It's not, it's not respectful to make them sit and wait as you're rolling it about. Um, so those examples seem to be about put, putting out putting out the congregation. They seem to be about like in a very active way not being respectful of people's of people's time, okay? Um, it doesn't seem like that should have any relevance to our topic, right? Those are incidences of quoted Sibor that are coming up that don't really have any connection to what could be an issue with a woman reading from the Torah. This one is a little bit more interesting and it's about Humashim, okay? Um, by humash here, well, the truth of the matter is that there's a debate about exactly what a humash means here. For our purposes, let's just say it's not a full Torah scroll. Okay. Question is, can you read the Torah reading from a not full Torah scroll? So, Rabbi Rav Yosef Dami Torvayu in Korean Bechumashim Bevei Teknesset Mishon Kvodat Zibur. Both of them said you can't read from an incomplete Torah scroll, whatever that means. It could take different forms. Like I said, Machloket debate. The Veda Knesset and Shul, you don't do your Creator create Torah that way. And the reason why you don't do it that way is Kvodat Sibur. Okay, now what's the issue of Kvodat Sibur here? So a first possibility, the Ron brings it up, is maybe it because it makes them look like they're too poor to have a proper safe Torah. Okay, maybe it, 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 it gives off the wrong impression. Okay. But there's another possible way of understanding it that gets suggested by um, by the Talmud Yerushalmi and built on by the Raviya that actually went, might wind up being more relevant for us in trying to understand what's going on with women in Kvodot So The Talmud Yerushalmi tells us the following story. There's a, there's a guy named Arskinas. I don't know anything about him. He's Okir Oraita de Tanberai. He went to this town and he burned their Torah scroll. 
disgusting. It's pretty horrific. Atun Shalun the Rabyona the Rabyosi Maun Likrot Besefer Barabim. They went and they asked Rabyona and Rabyosi, and you can understand from the context that this is what the word safer means in this context. Can we read from something that's not a full Torah scroll in public? He burnt our Torah scroll. Torah scroll is now burnt for the community. Tomorrow's Shabbos. Can we have some kind of a Torah reading? We have a partial Torah scroll. Can we have some kind of a Torah reading? Amar Lun, he said to them, Asr, absolutely can't. But now here's what gets interesting. Lo de Asur, now he didn't really mean that it was completely prohibited. Ella, rather, Mingodin Shahun Ugma, Agima, Inon Zivnin Lahun Achori, because they're going to have such great distress. They're, they're, they're going to be so upset by the situation of not being able to have a Torah reading, that's going to spur them to purchase another one. In other words, why was he concerned that they might go ahead and read from a partial scroll? Not because it would necessarily be totally halakhically impossible, but because it might lead them to be lax, not careful, about their obligations of the ideal way to do the Torah service. What we were talking about before with Kavod Sibor were examples of just inconveniencing the congregation. Um, this is a little different. This is about um, how, how the congregation, it's tied into how the congregation is supposed to be relating to the mitzvah. It's not just about in practice, do they feel dishonored? Apparently they didn't. It would have been more convenient for them to read from the partial school. In this case, it seems like it's also about something else, which is how, how is it going to affect the, this, almost like there's some normative view of how a congregation is supposed to operate and how is this going to affect their conformity to that view? Uh, the Ravia brings this. The two mipnei kvodot tzibur, um, shewanu. So kvodot tzibur also comes up with our chumashim. The aim pitron kvodot tzibur. Now he's going to explain what kvodot tzibur means. Aim pitron kvodot tzibur mipnei she'eno shalem. The issue, the kvodot tzibur thing, is not just about its being incomplete. Ella, rather, g'nai hu tzibur she'en lem sefer Torah suyak mitzvata. It's not respectful for the tzibur to have a sefer Torah that's not proper. The afal gav de lo efshar. Hashta lo sharina mahu, and even if it's impossible for them to have a full one right now, we don't permit it to them. Shema yidrash lo mir kinot sefer, lest they become negligent and not buy a sefer. So the Ravia picks up the Yerushalmi here, okay? And this view seems to be bringing up another aspect of Kvodat Sibor, which is is that how are we setting up the kind of standard that Tzibur is going to meet and our expectation that the Tzibur is going to do the utmost to meet that standard? There's like a dialogue going on here, quote at Tzibur. It's not just a question of are you honoring them in practice or dishonoring them in practice? There's something else going on. There's another example before we get to, to more directly to arts uh, that's very important. And this has to do also with Kriya Satura, and this has to do with, um, with someone in rags, a pocheach. Uh, there are two different definitions of what a pocheach is. One, one definition in Rambam is that his clothes are ripped like in the upper body so that's like his shoulders, uh, his shoulders are being exposed. A second explanation, you find it in Rashi, is this lower body and it's getting, and it's not, it's not necessarily exposing the air but proper, but it's getting close. To that area, and the Mishnah Megillah talks about talks about uh, the following. First of all, they say katan korev Torah. Okay, we've seen that already. And then pocheach poresetshma, a pocheach, uh, an adult male who's got these clothing that are ripped and exposing him in some area of the body, either upper or lower, can lead a kind of contracted shema ceremony, but a no korev Torah is not permitted to read from the Torah. They know verlif teva and is not permitted to lead to fila. They know no kapav and is not permitted to duchen. Okay, 
So the pocheach, the pocheach is not allowed to do those things. Now we had here a katan can read from the Torah, and we had that the pocheach cannot read from the Torah. Okay, you know how the Gemara thinks. What's the natural question that the Gemara wants to ask? What if you have a katan who's also a pocheach? Can a katan who's also a pocheach read from the Torah? What's the habamina? What would be different? Well, you know, just even uh, instinctively, we'll see it in the sources, but just even if you think about it, I think we do relate to a minor being underdressed or having some of their body exposed in a different way to how we relate to an adult having part of their body exposed, no? Um, neither of these things is obviously gonna be ideal for a Torah reader, that's a given. But what I'm saying is, if you were to see a kid walking down the street in rags that exposed part of his body, or an adult male walking down the street in rags that exposed part of his body, I don't know how you'd respond fully to, to, to these things, but you probably would be more troubled by the adult variant. Uh, the ki kids, we just have a, we have a different set of expectations and reactions to kids. Um, how does this play out in the Gemara? Ba'amine ula barav me'abaye. Ula asks Abaye the following. Katan pocheach ma'oshi kravatura. What if he's a katan, which means he should be able to read from the Torah, at least in some situations, but he's also pocheach, he's also in rags, and an adult in rags can't. Amar leh v'tibay l'cha rum. Ah, you know, you should have been asking about a naked minor. What do you mean? Arum my time alo. Why could a minor not read from the Torah naked? Now, this is really interesting. Mishum kvod sibur. Because of kvod sibur. Hachanami, here too. Mishum kvod sibur. Okay. Hmm. We're going to have to try to unpack this. We don't have a ton of time, so we're going to try to do it quickly. Uh, there's actually, there's two comments from Rashi. We're going to focus on the second one. So the truth of the matter is the Rashi here is a little difficult. Um, Rashi says like this. A gadol, an adult who's wearing rags and is exposed, he's prohibited from reading from the Torah, or we could, no, I, I'll say that a little differently. He has a prohibition. He's subject to the prohibition of exposing erva. Now, the, the pocheach doesn't necessarily really have his erva exposed. If we were talking here about the full erva being exposed uh, by the adult, that's, some, that, that's a whole other level of things, right? That's, that's the technical, technical issue of erva. We said that a pocheach can be pores al shma. We said that the pocheach can lead the short ceremony of shma, which is not representative of the full community. It's a more minor ritual than leading shmona esrei or reading from the Torah or dochening. Um, but he could still do it. So it's clearly not that his actual erva is exposed. So what Rashi seems to be saying is because he's subject to the laws of erva, it's inappropriate. It's a problem with kavod tzibur, even though this might not be technically erva that he's a pocheach now. We know it's not technically erva because he can be borez uh, al The adult pocheach is is in a situation because he's subject to the laws of erva where this is a sensitivity of kvoda tzibur. Now you might have thought of al katane no muzhar, that maybe because a katan isn't subject, he's not an adult, he's not subject to the full isur of their bat davar, then maybe we would relate to him differently now when he's in rags than from an adult. Odilmalo, odilmalo polyg, or maybe we make no distinction, or maybe the Mishnah makes no distinction between the adult and the minor when it comes to rags. And of course, the conclusion of the Gemara is no. He can't do it because of Kvoda Tzibor. So what is Rashi saying as a rationale? He's saying Kvoda Tzibor in the case of a pocheach has to do with something that's not technically erva, but is sort of on the erva continuum. Okay, something that's not technically a violation of erva, that would just be us, sir. But something that's on the continuum, there's more body being exposed here than usually is, that's an issue with kvoda tzibur. That's not how we want the community to be represented. We don't want the community, the reader of, for the shul, to be representing themselves by having more bodily exposure. Okay, 
Let's take this now and let's move back to our area of discussion, the woman and Codex Lord. Okay. Now, the background here for seeing the first uh, Rishon who addresses this at all is, um, is, is another sugi in the Gemara, another discussion in the Gemara, and this is a discussion about your Um Let's say uh, a man does not know how to say Birkatamazum for himself, and he has his son or his wife recite it uh, for him. Uh, it could mean here word for word. Uh, depending on, on the commentary you see, it could mean that it's, they're saying it word for word and he's repeating it after them, or it could mean that they're actually discharging the obligation. We're going to see that that's where Ritva is going to take it, okay? Um, the Talmud there says, and by the way, this is another Avalam Rucha Chamim, which is, uh, which is interesting. Tavo me'era adam she'ishto v'nav mevarchimo. It's a curse. A curse, it is fitting for a curse to come upon a person who in this situation has his son or his wife reciting the bracha for him. The question is why? What's the curse about? How do we understand this? But there are different explanations for what's going on. Let's look at how the Ritva understood it. Ritva, in accordance to that which we learned that or that we hold, he maintains the Ritva thinks that women are obligated on a Torah level in Birkat Amazon. Matnita Kipshata, then the sim we can go, we can learn this Brita in the simple, simplest way. We're talking about a Ben Gadol, we're talking about his son is an adult. His son is an adult male who ate the full amount. So he's technically able to discharge the father's obligation. The Atuhani umafkile. Okay, and now it could be him or it could be the wife who are discharging the obligation. So again, Ritva is understanding the Gemara as being a scenario of the son is an adult, i.e. fully obligated. The wife is an adult, fully obligated. And the Gemara is telling us that either way, a man should be, a curse should be fall a man who needs his wife or his son to discharge the obligation for him, even when they are both fully obligated adults who could technically do so. Why? He only discharges his obligation through the bracha because he's ignorant, because there's a Gemara that tells us, Generally speaking, we don't have one person discharge another person's obligation of Birkat Amazon if we don't have a Zimun. If we only have two, we usually say that one person should not discharge the other's obligation. They make Birkat Amazon separately when there's no Zimun, unless one of them really doesn't know Birkat Amazon and they need the help of the other to discharge the obligation. And this is why they said that this particular man should be cursed. Because he didn't learn. He didn't learn and he's discharging others' obligations. He's letting others discharge his obligations. Rav Henkin, when he would discuss this, he would say that it's not just that he didn't learn. His wife was able to learn. His son is able to learn. He's living with them and he still doesn't learn. In other words, the resources, the people are at his fingertips who could enable him to learn, and he still didn't learn. Does this sound a little familiar to you? This also echoes with that idea of being lax about one's obligations a little bit, right? This idea that there's some kind of measure that you're supposed to be able to meet, and you're sort of not necessarily doing your utmost to meet it. And now let's move to how the Ritva connects us to Kvod Tzibor. When the Ritva talks about uh, Megillah reading, which is not the same halacha, of course, but there's some uh, connection in talking about a woman reading. So we know that women are obligated in Megillah reading. Therefore, women technically can discharge a man's obligation. Ella, but this is the Ritva's view. There are other views about McGill reading. I think we covered that in this uh, in our in our series previously with Torah Motion, and you can see there. Um, there are other other views, but the Ritva says technically a woman should be able to discharge a man's obligation in Megillah. Ella she'ain't zekvod litzibur, but it's not kvod litzibur. And explaining what that means, he says vehen bichlal me'ira. 
This is in the category of Meira. Now, given that we just saw that what bothers, what, what Ridva sees is the fundamental issue with Meira is ignorance or a form of ignorance that is related to not taking one's obligations seriously. Okay, it seems that what the Ridva is getting at is that a woman's reading might be an issue of Kvod Sibur when a man who we know is obligated in the formal mitzvah of Talmud Torah is not necessarily, it might reflect that he's not necessarily taking his obligation seriously. Now, why should that be the case? I'm making some assumptions. The assumptions seem to be that most of the, let's say, uh, the, that the men, if they're obligated in Talmud Torah, then that means that they should take a greater level of responsibility for learning how to read the Torah. Um, which, by the way, you know, until the institution of the Baal Kore was something that people were really expected to do. They could be put on the spot sometimes. Um, Mishpatei Uziel, Rav Uziel, much more recently, but kind of putting this in his own terms. What Kvodot Sibor means, he thinks, is they shouldn't say there isn't a man here who doesn't know how to read from the Torah. Uh, we learned last time about the Rivash, or two times ago about the Rivash, who suggested that the reason why a woman could count as a reader is because maybe they wouldn't have enough readers. Um, this is kind of like the flip side. If people see that a woman's reading, maybe it's an issue of Kvodot Sibor because it's giving the impression that there aren't men who are able to read, uh, which is connected to an idea, or maybe if we have women reading, perhaps that's connected to an idea, uh, Rohankin puts it this way, that they're not being careful about, about making sure that they read. The issue of Sibur with respect to women reading, it's not just that it not appear that there aren't men who know how to read. Ella, Rather that we don't, part of it is that we don't want men from the get-go to just assume women are going to read it. And they're not going to bother ever to learn to read from the Torah. And to, and to, and to read with the proper cancellation for themselves. Okay, so they're suggesting this is a reason. Um, Rabbi Vadi Yosef puts it in similar terms. He, he has like a variation on this position. His variation, we don't have time to read it inside, his variation wants to connect it to obligation. He wants to say, well, if there's a communal obligation of Kriya Torah and there's a personal obligation in Talmud Torah, men have those obligations. And a woman doesn't have the obligation to help make sure there's a minion for Kriya Torah. And therefore, it's not quoted Sibor that someone who wasn't, who wasn't obligated to make sure Kriya Torah is going to happen is going to be conducting Kriya Torah. The whole thrust of this school of thought, I think it's very much parallels what we saw in the Yerushalmi and the Raviyah about Chumashim. And this is uh, something that a point that Rav Henkin made. And this is the idea that it, it's a tibur is also about, are you setting up the tibur, are you making them appear, or are you even encouraging the tibur not to be careful with their obligations? And yeah, they're, they're assuming here that the course tibur is men. And the reason they're assuming that is because to the extent that there's a communal obligation and it falls on uh, it falls on men to make sure that there's a minion. That relates to what we learned about in our first year and women can listen when they're there. Um, but that's different from making sure that it happens. Okay. Um, another possibility is comes up in the, uh, the Moroktia. This is by Rav Yaakov Emden. He's taking a completely different approach. And he says, it seems like a bondsman. Now remember, the laws of a bondsman and the laws of a woman are all often compared to each other because they share an exemption from positive time-bound commandments. He says, uh, a bondsman might be in a better position than a woman with respect to Torah reading. Why? Because at least ab initio, in an ideal situation, there's, an, there's a reason quote Sibor would stop a woman perhaps from reading, would stop a woman from reading. In any case where it's possible to have the reading without her. In other words, Kvod Sibor would apply to the woman, but not to the bondsman. Why? Again, by the way, if it were social status, that wouldn't be true. If it were social status, then, then a woman wouldn't be uh, lower than a bondsman in this case. Because, and he's paraphrasing Gemara here, uh, we can't have mixing in the shoal. 
Masha'in came be'evet, which is not a problem with the bondsman. It's not that we can't, it's that we only, we talked about uh, in an earlier series of Torah motion, I believe we learned about machitza and we talked about there were cases in the Beit HaMikdash where women would, 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 would come in, but was specifically in a case of need where she had to be inside the Azara. But generally speaking, women weren't all the time inside the Azara. So here too, he's saying, look, this issue is an issue of separation in the shul. Hmm. Rav Zalman Nehemiah Goldberg, obviously much later than Rav Yaakov Emden, you know, of, of our time till very recently, says, he thinks it has to do with sneers. Um, now we should note that not everyone buys this. For example, um, say from Menucha, uh, Rabbeinu Menor says, no way. This is Kvot Sibor, it's not a Sneas issue. So you should know, there are those who completely rejected the idea that this has anything to do with Sneas, completely out of hand. And at the same time, there are those who say that maybe Sneas is somehow related. Uh, Rav Uziel, um, no, Rav Uziel actually, I'm sorry, Rav Uziel agrees with Rav Enu Manoach, not that he needs uh, Rav Uziel's agreement, but there are others, Rav uh, Mashash, for example, thinks that it has to do with Tniyut. Um, why, is this, why is this relevant? Um, I think, look, it's not a perfect parallel, but it's a rough parallel. What do I mean? We talked about kind of two, we talked about three different possible definitions of Kodat Sibor on the whole. One was this, you're burdening the congregation, which is pretty clearly irrelevant to our case. A second definition of Kvodot Zibor that we talked about had to do with uh, the Chumashim, where it may be that it just makes the community look like it's impoverished, but it might have to do with uh, perceived laxity on the part of the congregation with its obligations or fostering laxity on the part of the, obligation, on the, part of the congregation with its obligations. That's the second possibility. And we saw a parallel there in the Ritva. There's also Rav Avram Minahar says what the Ritva says about Kvod Sibor connecting it to this idea of Me'era. A third possibility is that it's somehow related to Tzniyut. And again, we just saw Rabbeinu Menor completely rejects it being related to Tzniyut. The Ritva does not seem to think it's Tzniyut. But there's this other possibility it's related to Tzniyut. I want to suggest that that might also, in its own way, be kind of loosely conceptually connected to what we saw when we talked about the pocheach. The pocheach, you'll remember, wasn't really technically a case of erva. It was like, it's not an issue of erva, but somehow it's on the slope towards erva. Um, that's also a little bit of a tzniyut-ish concern. It's in the same kind of global world of halachic concerns, and it's brought up in the context of kvod uh, Rav Shafter, uh, makes a suggestion that tries to bridge both of these explanations. Rav Shachter's suggestion, let me see if I, I, I don't think I can get the English for you on the screen with the Hebrew, sorry, but let's look at the Hebrew. I'm, you know, I'm skipping the beginning of this because it actually it's based on an assumption that's, that's very interesting, but I want to move to the, to, to the next part. Certainly, if there's no man in a minion who knows how to read from the Torah, yesh lanu levakesh me isha we, we, we should ask from a woman that she read. Aval, ein zamina nachon mitang kvodat zibor. But it's not correct to do this from kvodat zibor. It's not something we should do unless we have no other choice because of kvodat zibor. Why? Shebazeh shemachrichim leisha lavor amidat atzniyut shela, the fact that we're forcing a woman uh, to cross over her attribute of tzniyut, now this is difficult. He's assuming that anytime anyone does something in public, it's a violation of tzniyut. Uh, that's, that's not so clear, but I think he's hitting on something that we might relate to a little bit more. And to read in public, We show for the community as a whole that there are no men there who know how to read, which is a reflection on the community as a whole and not just a reflection on the men of the community. Uh, what, what's, what, what's the idea that I think uh, we, can, we, can, we can tease out of here? Uh, in effect, I think he's trying to bridge the two, the two approaches and he's saying something along the lines of this. We have certain norms of who's leading to philot or ritual in Orthodox shuls. We have separation and generally speaking, we don't have women reading the rituals. If we're going to have a woman read from the Torah, it's possible that this could be done in a pressing situation, he says, and we're gonna talk more about that based on next time. Um, it's possible that could be done in a very pressing situation where there isn't another option, but it clearly is not adhering to our usual norms 
of how we're separating men and women in the shul or how or how women are uh, are presenting during davening and if that's the case then the fact that we would veer from our normal uh, our normal ways of setting men and women up in shul for the purpose of having a woman read might also imply and we're back to that whole thing imply laxity with obligation or foster laxity with obligation so he's kind of like trying to bridge these two explanations and put them together um Okay, I'm going to stop the share now, kind of summarize where we are, and set us up for next week. So what, what did we see so far? We actually saw a lot, um, and, it's, and it's complex. What we saw is that we have a Brighta in the Talmud. The Brighta in the Talmud tells us about this possibility that women could read from the Torah, and then it says, but it's not something we're supposed to do. Uh, there's some discussion about what it means that there's not, it's not something we're supposed to do, um, but this, the simple reading of the text is that it means it's not something we're supposed to do. Um, okay, does that leave room? And what's the why? And there's a why given, and the why given is Kvoda Tzibor. The why doesn't appear in the parallel to Sefta, but it does appear there in the Bright and the Talmud because of Kvoda Tzibor. And the question becomes, okay, what's Kvoda Tzibor? So we looked at the examples. We saw that there are three different categories, broadly speaking, burdening the congregation, like making everyone sick as you're rolling the Torah into place. That's an issue of Kvoda Tzibor. We saw this category of Kvoda Tzibor that has to do with how is the congregation relating to their obligations? Are they able to fulfill their obligations? Are they looking like they're not? Are we fostering a situation where they're not doing it? It is men focused. It's either men focused because we're assuming that Kriya Satora is generally done by men who have the formal obligation of Talmud Torah, or, and this is Rabbi Ovadia Yosef's variation of the idea, it's men focused because men have the obligation to help make sure that there is a communal Kriya Satura. So the expectation is that they would be the ones taking the lead in the ritual if there's any choice in the matter. Okay, so that's one possibility. And another possibility, which is not, we don't find in really early texts before Rabbi Yaakov Emden spelled out, is that this has to do with Tznias. Um, what Tznias means isn't so clear. We saw something that might be a little bit related to this in the case of the Katan Pocheach and the discussion in the Gemara about the Katan in rags, where the discussion there doesn't revolve around is it really technically a violation of erva, but something a little short of that. And here too, the discussion we see is about, well, is this, how is this with mixing in shul? Other variations of this that have been raised, well, what about Kol Isha here? Is that an issue? Um, Rav, um, I think it's Rav Metzasa actually says that maybe it's about we don't want uh, men being distracted during davening, which is you know possibly one of the reasons why we have separation in the synagogue. Uh, it's one of the reasons it's given at least. Um, th there's a lot of different possibilities of what the Tzniah's concern uh, might be. And I'm suggesting it might in some broad conceptual sense uh, connect to that case of the Pocheach that we saw in the Talmud. Um, but in any case, those are the kind of those are the kind of two main perspectives on what's going on. So, what would be the issue with the woman reading? Either she's giving the impression that the men there can't be bothered, or she's helping them not being bothered to learn to read the Torah, which we think is particularly prob particularly problematic because men have an obligation in Talmud Torah, and because we need men to make sure that there's a minion for Kriya Torah. Um, or it's because there's something here that's going to undo our usual setup of men and women in the shul. Um, and that poses a concern. Though that second obligation is a little bit, it's a little bit harder to find because we don't see it directly in the Rishonim in their explanation of this. And not only that, we have Rabbeinu Manoch who says, well, if that's what you mean, we would say it. Kvodat Zibor is not Pritzut, Nick, period. Okay, so those are the rationales that are given. What we still have to talk about, and we'll take the questions in a minute, what I want to talk about next week is kind of the core arguments that have been brought about, well, do those things still stick? You know, um, what happens to those rationales once we do have a balkal ray? Does that change the game? Uh, what happens to those rationales in a pressing situation? Uh, is there a way that we can wave Kvodat Sibor? Does the fact that this can be challenging for women have some halachic weight and what would that be? So those that's an awful lot of things for us to talk about next week. Uh, that is Rada Shem will, uh, will do good things. Uh, let's, see, let's see what your questions are for now. I see okay. there's a lot going on here. Rabbi Jay, help me out. Yeah. Okay. Just before I start the question, you mentioned how Rav Schechter's view of Sneas is a little bit, you know, you know, difficult anything in public. I know I was in a shear in YU for four years, and um, 
he often made that comment that Snius is anything you do in public. The Torah wants men to everybody to be be tsanua. That's why when you ask somebody to daven, he should say no three times. Right. Men and women. Just on occasion, on occasions, uh, not, I mean, somebody has to violate, you know, sneer, as, as he would put it. He says it's a violation of men. But okay, but somebody has to lead the services. So, okay, so the Torah preferred that men do it. I'm not saying it's a common view or etc., but it, it's not Rav Schachter's very. Um, it really is his, it's his view. Very, and it's what his worldview. That, that's part of his, uh, very much his worldview. Okay. Right. And I, I hope I treated it with appropriate respect. What I was trying to say, I guess, for, for time, I, I hope I wasn't disrespectful because of time, but what I was trying to say was, even if that's not how you understand Sniut, and I, I think still think it's something understand. interesting in what he was saying uh, because because of, of this idea that it, it is different from how we usually conduct things with men and women in the show. And that, that I think is already something, uh, that, that's something a little different, even if the, that assumption, that worldview isn't necessarily shared by everybody. Okay, now we can go through the comments and questions. Uh, Susanna pointed out, footed zebra is not socially acceptable. That was then. That's the point you brought at the beginning. And I assume you'll discuss more more next week how to make Well, I want to just say again, like, so it's just hard. You know, people want to, the, there's kind of a jump to say, well, clearly, footed zebra is just, you know, about social status. It's just that it doesn't, we don't see that, we don't see that said um, in discussions of footed zebra. We don't see that in the examples, in the Talmudic examples, and we don't see it. We don't see it in the, in, in the text. That there aren't a huge amount of texts that talk about what quoted Tibor means, but we just don't, it doesn't really show up in traditional sources. So as as much as that might sound like, oh yeah, that's gotta be it. Um, it's it's really hard to say, oh yeah, that's it when it's not showing up in the Macaroni. I bet I, I do remember a friend of mine once saying the example you gave about rolling a safer Torah, you know, with sometimes the guy forgets and it's a pain and you sit there for five minutes and everybody talks and is upset. He said, you know, they don't go, nobody go, goes crazy about that. But, you know, woman Aliyot, he was sort of using that as an argument. Like, we're not so careful about not rolling a safer tour, but we're very careful. But of course, there are other reasons for that. But yes, okay. Um, uh, I'm uh, asking, I guess you also sort of alluded to it. You'll pick up next, you were talking later. Does Kavod Tzibur on a practical level mean men, not a whole community? I, you were discussing, it means, it means the whole community. Right. Tzibur doesn't just mean men. You know, it's sort of like, um, remember the, the, the conception, and you find this a lot in our traditional sources, the conception is that if a man is learned, that's something that the whole community helped to foster, right? Um, the, the, the father might be obligated to teach the son, and the son might be obligated to learn from the father um, or to learn for himself, but the, but the entire community is invested in their being, in their being learned people in the community. Um, as I said, it's uh, even on the one hand there, I think there definitely is, and I pointed it out, there is a male-centric uh, perspective here in terms of the tzibur, in part because it's the it's the tzibur of men that are making up Torah readings. Um, and for better or worse, this is still true to us to, to this day, that uh, there are a lot of Torah readings that go on. Uh, for example, a lot the partnership made on him, uh, to the best of my knowledge, do not meet on Mondays and Thursdays. Um, and that's significant. And on Mondays and Thursdays, sometimes there are women in shul. In a lot of shuls, there are women in shul increasingly on Mondays and Thursdays. But there's very, very, very many minyanim that don't have any women present for Kriya Satora on Monday and Thursday. Um, so part of that also might be in deference to what we learned. Maybe it's specifically when there are seven that a woman could read. But um, it's, it's just, a, it's, it's, it's a whole interesting, you know, it's, it's sort of like, is it fair? What is a chicken and egg? But fundamentally, the men are required to make up the minion and have that have that uh, responsibility, and uh, and therefore they they are being assumed to be the ones who would be there. It's it's noteworthy if they're not, as it were, showing up in a in a way that it's uh, not as noteworthy if the women are not showing up. And that's I think that's still uh, in practice true in in many communities today. Yeah, I mean that's uh that's a question. You know, the women want to go to Minion. I mean, the men, it's 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 not so simple to go to Minion on Mondays and Thursdays. Uh anyways, okay. Um Noah pointing out that I for, I forget the name of the person, right? You had quoted that he was uh, a Roman lieutenant in the time of Hadrian. Okay. Thank Very, you. Okay. All right. Um, how did the Chumash go from an incomplete scroll to a printed book version of the Torah? I that's just I think. It's, it's a thing of terminology. There really are different views of what exactly we're talking about with Chimashim in the Talmud, but I think the, the most compelling one is just that it's a partial scroll. 
but mm. chumash is really a term for a piece of the Torah that's not the full Torah. So, you know, it, it, that can be used also for, you know, a, a fifth of the Torah that we're reading in a book. It's, you know, I, uh, Kara pointing out, which I know there's been, you know, papers written about this, that let's say the, uh, the, um, there are less men applying to rabbinical school in the conservative reform movement once they started accepting women. So the men have become less inclined to become rabbis, uh, perhaps not going to show. That's the point of Pinchas Perv reminds her of the men. She was not showing up for daily minion as the woman count. That's, I think that's very, has been an issue for them. It's, yeah, they call it feminization. Um, it's it's actually a really complicated issue um, when, um, which you know, it's it's not a purely halachic issue. It, it's 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 deeper than that. Um, right. Which is which is how do how do men um, to to what extent is part of what's going on in show um, appealing to men because. Um, because women aren't uh, aren't taking a leading role, and that that's really complicated. By the way, it's not like if you're in a partnership meeting that doesn't exist. There's a woman who wrote a book. She's um, she's gone through a lot of hashkafic shifts in her own life, and it's a really complicated book. A woman wrote a book about the experience of men in partnership minyanim, interviewing men in partnership minyanim, and um, Actually, I mean, again, it, it's it's a really complicated book, but in, in this, it's called the men's section, if you're interested in seeing it. But in this, in some of these interviews, she's talking about the men saying that like they tune out when a woman's leaning um, or that it's not, it's, it's, it's frustrating for them. It, 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 it's, it's um, even in the communities where men are highly committed, at least in theory, uh, to, to women participating in ritual, it's not always so simple. But this is, uh, you know, that, that this is not just a, that's, that's already not really a, the halachic discussion. It's something, it's something, it's something else. It's not quote at Sibur, uh, per se. It's, it's something that's, that sounds related, but it's not the definitions that we were looking at in the sources, certainly. Lori's being, be, Lori's being extremely nice and doesn't want to say that there are a lot of men who are sexist and that's what their opposition to all this stuff is based on. It's nothing to do with. You know, I don't think it's pure. I don't think it's pure sexism. I think it's really. I think Some, it's all, I'm not I saying. Think it's I'm not saying. I don't mean God forbid to say everybody, but that for sure exists. To deny that that exists, I think is just. No, there, there, there is. Look, that. is there sexism? Men who are in not so observant to look at these men, they're the most. Thing that has nothing to do with halakha, but it's it's sort of anti sibur I would argue. Um, but um, and on your comment about you know how men feel, I'm I I I've, I've twice been to a partnership meeting personally, both times invited to um, a simcha, and uh, I at the first time I went, I was very I don't know nervous. How would I feel? And I, I must say it felt um, I know very normal and very. First of all, I enjoyed it that it was extremely quiet. Unfortunately, that's a whole other issue that I you know that. And the men, if we would pay as much attention, if all the people opposed to partnership union would be opposed to talking in shul, uh, we'd be a lot better off. Leave the woman alone and just worry about the men talking in shul, but we won't go there for now. So it was extremely quiet and I found it quite meaningful. I, it, and the, some of the women lay beautifully. What what can I tell you? You know, say so you have beautiful right, voice. So, I mean, this is a you no, know, there's, I'm just, a lot, I'm just there's, there's that variation. Out. There's variation in the minions and the experience and men's experiences. There's, you know, there, 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 there are. Uh, this whole question of feminization would affect some subset. It's not going to affect everybody. Uh, that's for sure. And yeah, but anyways, that's just uh, that is an interesting phenomena. How this ties in, you know, with the women coming in and all, you know, uh, how will all the women, you know, in positions, how's that going to impact on men and et cetera. I, I think that is some of the fear. And even even among the Yoatzot, even against those opposed to Yoatzot, I think there's a fear people won't use the rabbis anymore. But okay, let's move on. Uh, tzibur is a tzibur of women only, which it really isn't. But uh, but Judith pointing out, it doesn't make the men uh, 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 uneducated. What I would say is in today's world, we all understand that women can be, it's not embarrassing to say a woman knows more than her husband. It's not embarrassing, I hope not. I, and I hope it's not embarrassing when a woman earns more than her husband. You know, two generations ago, even one generation ago, and you know, the woman's, uh, you know, a high powered lawyer, a medical doctor, and the husband is, you know, a nice guy, meaning not, that he doesn't make as much money. So I would agree in today's world, um, those arguments, at least uh, for modern people, don't, don't apply. Women can be more. So one of the things, so 
one of the things that we have to talk about, and this this I'm hoping we're going to get to uh, planning to talk about next week, is are we talking about how people feel? Like, are we talking about subjectively people actually feel embarrassed? Or are we talking about some kind of some kind of like norm of what's expected for the community or how the community is expected to operate, which is sort of like independent of how individuals in the community feel? So we're, we're going to have to get to that. Um, okay. Um, you, know, you see what I'm saying? Like, it's quoted Tibor about like your sense of kavod, or is quoted Tibor a, a kind of a more absolute concept? That's something we're going to have to. That, of course, would tie in who can be mochelet, exactly, etc. Of course. And okay, Kolisha will leave for now. <coughs> and I guess you'll address maybe well, a little next week. No, I'll just say very quickly, Kolisha, it's a really good point about Kolisha. Um, and the the one of the essential dis, in, in in the discussions of Kol Isha in a sacred context, one of the things that gets looked at is well, they didn't bring Kol Isha up when they talked about women in Kriya Satora, um, and different answers are given. One answer is yeah, it's not a Kol Isha issue if a re woman reads from the Torah. Done. Another answer given is oh well, they must have been talking about the woman reading and not actually doing it with the truck because otherwise, obviously, it would be Kol Isha. So you get the whole spectrum, and you can't totally resolve it. But there is a, there is certainly uh, there, there, there's, there is an argument to be made that based on this, when it comes, and perhaps this isn't also is this extended to other ritual song, or specifically when it's cancellation? That's also a question, right? Um, but you could definitely make an argument, and there are halachic authorities who have made this argument from here. Rav Vadya safe among them more recently that if a woman is leaning in the singy way of leaning. That's not Kolisha. Not everybody agrees, but it's. And it's also, I think we have to distinguish between how Kolisha developed as a halachic concept and how it's understood in the Gemara. In where it's a much more limited concept, basically Kriyachma and stuff. It's so um, so perhaps the Gemara and Megillah. It's it's a, a more a more common. But you know, com Kolisha I think it's a big bag in the Gemara. Let's. Okay. Okay. I'm just you know you asked me to you yeah. know okay. Um, uh, Avi wants to know: um, Is the bright uh, codifying a practice? Like, or in other words, was there a time period in halakha that woman did get a liot, and the bright just said, "You're right, your shul's okay, but you know what? We don't like that anymore." Uh, so that's it's a great question, and uh, some of the discussions also about partnership and have centered on that. Um, you know, can we assume that this happened, and then it was, as it were, taken away or changed? Or, uh, or is this was this always a theoretical, a theoretical discussion? We don't have we don't have proof that this happened. Um, I I I wouldn't. I'm not in a position to say that this never happened, but I'm not in a position to say, oh yeah, this definitely happened. There's like this. Um, Rishberber in his book quotes. Um, this, it's, this is actually fascinating to me. There's a woman named uh, Pircha Sasson, Flora Sasson, who was this very very uh, learned uh, Sephardi uh, woman from a great uh, I think I think the family was originally Iraqi. She was in um, may, maybe I think I might be getting the uh, the community wrong, but she lived in London for a good part of her life. Very wealthy woman, very 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 learned woman. And she um, there's a story that's told that when she went to uh, Iraq, in one of the biographies of her, that when she went to Iraq with her uh, with her family, that they called her up to the Torah in the synagogue. So. Rav Sperber brings this as an example that this historically happened. Now, of course, this is in the Tanaitic period, so it's not as helpful as he wants it to be. Uh, what's interesting is, I, you know, I haven't gotten my hand on the original biography, but I was able to see I, uh, her son's journal from the trip is available online, and it describes them going to Shul, and it says, I got the Aliyah, and it doesn't say anything about his mother getting an Aliyah, which doesn't mean it's, I don't know, maybe it's a different trip. Um, what I'm trying to say is, like, when you, when, when you see that, I, I, that, that someone like Rav Sperber, who has a, a very... Uh, large knowledge of, of, you know, of, uh, of these early sources and would certainly bring them, can't, can't give a hard and fast, you know, yes, this was a community that did it. Um, it's, just, it's just not clear. So, you know, it says, hakol olin leminyan shiva afilu katan afilu isha. Aval amru chachamim ba 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 ba. It really could be a theoretical discussion. And it could be a practical discussion. And even if it's practical, we don't know that it's practiced. And even we cannot be sure that that's chronologically later, as opposed to, you know, some other kind of dialogue. So I can't, I can't fully, you know, I can't give you a clear answer to that question, though it would be 
you know, we don't, we'd all love to know. <laughs> you know, we would. Monday will discover archaeological evidence, maybe, maybe. You never know what the, they discover, all kinds of new things. We'll see. Okay. Uh, oh. Zoe, I'm very happy to, I'm very sad to hear that at your, you've been to partnership meeting that the people are talking. I'm very uh, upset that they picked up some of the bad habits. Um, you know, I have to say, it's one of the other complicated things here. I really want to focus on Kriya Satora and not the partnership phenomenon as a whole, because it's really a broader, a broader thing. But, um, in general, when you have a movement that's a new movement that um, people are connected to um, are, are connected to by choice, uh, they're often going to be more kind of like more passionate about what they're doing. So, um, so I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of people do report a sense in partnership minyanim that there's a particularly strong feel up for them. Um, some of that might have to do with women participating, but some of that might have to do with people being more into it because that's that's a culture of, of you know, a breakaway minyan movement. Um, so it, it, it also doesn't, you know, doesn't, doesn't really help us figure out what's going on with Kriya Satora as much as we might like, though, um, though it certainly could be Just very enough. positive. Important sociological comment, you know, right, right. Once they get to establish, then they pick up the routines. What can I say? Ravinit Henkin once had this great comment where she said, if I gave an, if I were able to be in two places at one time, and I gave an optional shear at the same time that I gave an official shear, the optional shear would be much more popular. <laughs> right. Uh, Ganu, well, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, let's, that's the Ruff's, you know, the Ruff's famous comment. If he would uh, come to, to YU at three o'clock in the morning and he would announce he's giving a shear hundreds of, of students who show up for Soloveitchik, such a phenomenal muggy shear. But when he talked, if he, but they weren't interested in his, you know, uh, his philosophical views, like they, they weren't interested in like, uh, he taught, um, I think it was Tanya one year, he was teaching in, in Boston, even then no, nobody was interested. They just want the Gemara, you know, that they're interested in, but uh, other things, listen, people aren't interested in, what, what can we say? All right. Uh, well, well, I certainly uh, hope, I mean, in the test will be, I certainly hope the partnership Minyanim uh, will, will, will preserve the, some of the really strong passion of the tefillah over time. That's something that, you know, if you know as long as they're going on they should be as passionate as they can be that's uh, for sure okay uh careful now we sort of alluded to last week but maybe you'll pick up next week and then we the issue of of the katan you're of course focusing on the woman but the brighta is um afilu katanim also right. so, we uh, talked about that a little bit last time we saw them at Erie, which really explains that the katan's a, a little bit of an easier case because the katan has you know the, the adult is obligated to teach the katan torah and it's back to this connection to the obligation in talmud torah and and how that positions you ashkenazi practice is really not to call uh katan to the torah sparty practice is varied there are sparty communities where katan will be will be called to the torah it's seen as and again though the whole if you look at the discussion and the rationale behind it, where it's justified, it's justified because it's training him in mitzvot for the future of being able to read from the Torah. It's like uh, that that's how it's being seen, is that it's sort of like he has a temporary, he has, he's already in the world of Tama Torah and he's temporarily a katan and this is an investment, as it were, in in the uh, in the future, uh, we saw the Rivash who says, you know, it's they don't have enough laners. But yeah, it is. It does wind up being a kind of separate discussion, and it seems to be very community dependent. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, part four next week uh, in practice, moving from the third century to the twenty-first century, and uh, what goes on in practice, what should, can, will, if maybe, and uh, that's next week. Please God, same time, same channel. Uh, this evening, Moshe Sokolov, Dr. Moshe Sokolov, his weekly Haftorah Shir. I invite those who have yet to attend to join us. Uh, if you're living in Israel, you don't have to join us. Okay. Um, and then tomorrow, Shuli Mishkin, 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, and tomorrow night, Rabbi Sho Robinson of Lincoln Square Synagogue, our partial Shir, Friday morning, 9.30, my, my Pirkei Avot Shir. Uh, Sunday, Rabbi Daniel Feldman on the Halakha and Human Relations, followed by Rabbi Liebtag on Climbing Marcina, Harsinai, uh, the, the Torah, Yitro and Dvarim leading the Aserat Hadith wrote in the Chumash in a whole presentation, Mamad Harsinai. And then Monday, Ari Shvat continues with his series on religious Zionism. Mark Shapiro fin is almost finished, the uh, part 48, part 48 on his book, on uh, his correspondence with Gedolim with rabbinic figures, very going through all the letters wow. he's writing. 
Yeah, we have a few. We told them up to Shavuos so at 49. Next Monday night would be week 49, but it's it's Shavuos. So, uh, and then actually he's going to get back when he finishes in a few weeks, probably meaning another three, four weeks. I don't know exactly. Um, he doesn't know exactly either. Uh, um, he'll start his, back to his great rabbinic series and we'll be doing Shaul Lieberman. We'll be starting with actually, he's got that many, many Gedoli Israel from a, also fascinating. Um, they're all online if you want to watch, although they're not all on video. And then um, Tuesday morning, the last of or Wiscon class on Chassidut and Ilana Goldstein Sachs on Megillah Ruth. And that takes us to next Wednesday and Marty Lakshin and Lori Novak. So the, please, God, we'll see you and see you during the week. And there we go. Okay. Laila Tov and Efrat Yom Tov here and everybody be well and be safe and healthy thank and you so much. Look forward to learning with you. Thank you and thank you to the Friedmans again for their sponsorship. And uh, okay, we we'll look forward to seeing you all and learning with you. Be well, everybody. Thank you. Bye -bye. Rabbi Jay, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. I'm just a shatran, you know, but uh, may, you know, uh, what can I say? <laughs> all right. All right. Have a good, good time. Yeah, bye.